Well, today we're going to talk about the gathering of Israel as a nation. Now, obviously, we're not going to talk about the individual the, uh, uh, Israelite, all right? Because, well, they are saved uh, as they accept Christ. Uh, we're going to talk about the nation. Uh, it's a bit more complex uh, as a nation. Okay. Um, to begin with, God declares that the earth is his. So are his people. And he is as particular about the people as about the land. Right? And we read this in 2 Chronicles 36, 1. Where when Babylon came, destroyed Jerusalem, and his people were taken captive for 70 years in Babylon. In that 70 years, in 2 Chronicles 36, 21, it said Jerusalem, which was desolate, destroyed. And joy, Sabbath, a rest, a spiritual rest. For 70 years, even when desolate. So much as God wants his people to have that spiritual rest with him, he also wants his people on the land, and when his people are obedient on the land he gives them, that land is as holy as the people are. But when the people are disobedient and rebellious, killing the prophets, the people might as well be removed, and then the land will have its spiritual rest, enjoy its spiritual rest. Okay, So the two things come together. God is as particular about his people as the land he gives them. Now, this is again emphasized in the conditional promise that God gave Israel. Now, in Leviticus 25, we read, 25, 2, we read these words. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. So God is hopeful. When you come into the land which I shall give you, well, the land will have its Sabbath because hopefully Israel will be obedient. But he goes on, if, if you are disobedient, I will send a sword. I will send pestilence. I will destroy your cities. So God is as particular about his people as about the land. This is something we've got to understand. All right, now, God had always scattered Israel for their disobedience and regathered them in the expectation of their obedience. Okay? So obedience, uh, Keeping the Sabbath, keeping the law of God is as important for both his people and for his land. Now, in the middle of this uh, slide is a chart. Israel's two gatherings. On the left is the present or first gathering of 1948. All right, when Israel or Israelites return to part of the land, not all the land. They return in unbelief, still rejecting Christ. Um, they were restored to the land only and not to Christ. Okay? And the last point, it sets the stage for tribulation. Now, this chart was, it reflects the common expectation. And I got this from a writer called John Woods. Okay? So that is the common perception today of Israel since 1948. However, the same perception or the, uh, the common perception is for, on the right, the, a permanent secondary gathering when Israel will return to all the land as promised by God. Okay? They will return in faith right, to the Lord. They 
will be restored to the both the land and God. All right, you see that uh, as the third point. And that sets the stage for the millennial kingdom on earth. Okay. But how will it happen? How will it happen? And John Woods, the writer, says uh, on the left, that column, it's the stage is set for the tribulation. It is during and in the tribulation that Israel as a nation will be saved. All right, so I'm going to explore these thoughts and to see if, well, um, the Bible says what we think it says. All right, now, my reaction is on the left. God had always scattered Israel for unbelief and rebellion. Never gathered them. So in 1948, they were supposedly gathered. Uh, I find that hard to believe that God gathered them. But I think John Woods thinks that God had gathered them for the tribulation, for the great tribulation, in which it is in the great tribulation that Israel will be saved. All right. So on the right, God's regathering of Israel will will be in expectation of their belief and obedience as God witnessed to the world. I think that's a crucial thing. Right? G well, Israel has to fulfill what God wants it to do. So it's not just gathering Israel for them to be saved. It's gathering them to bear fruit, to be a witness to the world. So the question is how and when. Right, now, Right in the middle of this uh, graphics, uh, that black arrow is the Great Tribulation, a global tribulation, where the wicked, 666, persecutes the righteous. Now, God in his mercy, in Revelation 7, 1 to 4, will seal 144,000, the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, these are the righteous 12 tribes because the 12 tribes, the names had eliminated Dan and Ephraim, who had gone after idols. Okay, so here God seals 144,000, 12 tribes of Israel, to give three messages to the whole world that the world may be saved, that the world will avoid 666 and avoid the plagues. And this 144,000 are sealed to give the three messages before the Great Tribulation because it is in the Great Tribulation that 666 is enforced. It's mandated. All right? So the 144,000, their characteristics. In Revelations 14, we read this, okay? The number one, they follow the Lamb. In other words, these 12 tribes, 144,000, they are converted. They believe in Christ. They not only believe in Christ, they follow the Lamb. Number two, they keep the commandments of God. Now, that's not surprising in relation to Israel, right? They keep the Ten Commandments. Number three, they have the faith of Jesus. Hence, this 144,000, this 12 tribes, characterized as the nation of Israel must be converted before the Great Tribulation to give the warning that in the Great Tribulation, Babylon will arise with great power and enforce 666. All right, so, so before that Great Tribulation black arrow is this place where Israel, as the 12 tribes, as a nation, has its last chance to follow the Lamb, to have the faith of Jesus, to give the three messages of Revelation 14, to be a witness to the world, to bear fruit for God. Okay? Now, so, if Israel remains unconverted as the Great Tribulation starts, then Israel would be still unbelieving, would be still unrighteous, would be wicked, and may lend its powers to Babylon. 
that's the risk. So, I think the basic fact is Israel, 144,000, 12 tribes, needs to be converted before the Great Tribulation. Okay? Now, think, think, think about it. That's a crucial point. Now, again, in the middle of this uh, slide is that global Great Tribulation. Okay? It's the judgment of the living. And why do I call it the judgment of the living? Because in Matthew 24, 37, we read, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The coming of the Son of Man is equated to the time of Noah. When the floods came, if you were in the ark, you were righteous and you're safe. If you're out of the ark, you're unrighteous, unbelieving, and you perished. So it was a judgment of the living at that time. But the Great Tribulation also divides the world into only two groups. Either you accept 666 or you reject 666. And this enforcement is by all nations. And you can read this in the book of Revelation. Okay? Not only individuals are, are, are affected, but it is enforced by nations. If a mark of worship, 666, and it's a mark of worship. It's enforced. Uh, this religious mark must be enforced by government. It must be legalized. The mark must be legalized. And it must be enforced. For example, if you can't buy and sell, obviously the banks, the government, has frozen your bank account. And in Revelation 13, 15, there's a death decree. Now, death decrees are, are from the government. So, it's enforced, right? So nations make laws. So because the mark of worship is enforced, government is at play. So nations are at work enforcing this. So the judgment of the living is not just a judgment of individuals. It's a judgment of nations enforcing worship. Now, worship is of the free will, is of the conscience, cannot be enforced. But nations at that time do this evil deed. Now, for those who reject this end of freedom, this suppression of conscience, they are unbelievers. And the Bible says in Revelation 16, the plagues will fall on the ones who accept the mark. But for the righteous who reject the mark, right, they live, they survive. Okay? So when Jesus comes at the end of the Great Tribulation, the righteous dead are resurrected. The righteous living who have rejected 666 are caught up with the resurrected righteous dead. And both or all righteous are then up in the clouds with Christ forever. And we read this in 1 Thessalonians 2, 16 to 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So, where are the righteous? All the righteous, the resurrected righteous, the living righteous, they are up in the air in heaven for at least the next thousand years, the millennium, and then they descend with the new Jerusalem, to a, an earth made new. All right, so bottom line, the righteous are in heaven in the millennium. All right, and what of the earth during the millennium? The unbelievers who had accepted 666, they all die. Well, the seven last plagues would wipe 
out, perhaps the majority. But the Bible gives many more verses, texts, where the wicked, when Christ comes, will all perish. Now, in one, two, three, uh, four verses, Matthew, Luke, uh, First Thessalonians, and Revelations, it gives you that fact. But Jeremiah and Isaiah on the left also tells you this to be true. So the earth during the millennium is desolate. Now, getting back to this chart, right, from John Woods. On the left, on the first regathering, I think we should know that at no time in history has God gathered Israel when still in rebellion and unbelief. So that gathering may be just political. Right? That's my first reaction. Now, on the expected, commonly expected regathering, a return to all the land, a return in faith, and restored to the land and to the Lord, I have this to say. Israel as a nation, comprising the 12 tribes of Revelation 7, must follow Christ, have the faith of Christ, before the Great Tribulation, for the purpose of being God's witness to the world. Again, 666. All right? That is that global scenario, uh, the Great Tribulation, in which Israel finds itself, as with all nations. All right? Now, as to the last point, it sets the stage for millennium blessing. I would think that is meant by the earthly uh, a millennium kingdom ruled by Christ. And we've discussed this before. All the righteous, when Christ returns, whether dead or living, are up in heaven during the millennium because all the wicked are dead. So the earth is desolate. There's no possibility of an earthly kingdom, millennial kingdom ruled by Christ. Now, it is made clearer in the book of Hebrews, uh, particularly chapter 11. Now, let's read verse 10 first. And he, Abraham, look for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. So Abraham was look for, not looking for <laughs> an earthly piece of land, the promised land, but for a city whose builder is God. Now Hebrews 11 verse 13 then says, these, and, and it lists a whole list of the faithful, starting with Abel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so forth and so forth. And these all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. Uh, they, were, they, they were not uh, looking for an earthly kingdom. They were strangers and pilgrims on earth. Verse 16, but now they desire a better country. That is a heavenly, a heavenly, not an earthly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city, a heaven. Verse 39. And these, all having obtained a good report through faith, receive not the promise. Now, that is obvious because they are all the righteous dead. They receive not the promise. Well, well first of all, because they're dead. But secondly, because the, the heavenly a city has not yet come. All right, now, verse 40 makes it absolutely clear. God, having provided some better thing for us, now who are us at that point? The writer of Hebrews is talking to, right, the Sinaitic Jews, the converted, and Gentile Christians, right, for us, and for us now, living, right, that they, the righteous did, without us, should not be made perfect. And that word perfect means complete, consummated, in heaven, not earth. In 
other words, the righteous dead. And we, if Christ should come right now, tomorrow, right? If we, or the righteous would be, well, the righteous dead, they, they would be resurrected. Enter righteous living, us will be caught up with the righteous dead, they, right? Abel, <laughs> Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the Lord. And we would meet the Lord in the air and be with him forevermore in the millennium to begin with. And then come back to a renewed earth after the thousand years. So, will there be a millennial kingdom on earth for the righteous? No. And if Israel were to come into the great tribulation, unconverted, is that any good? Is it? They have to be converted as the 12 tribes before the great tribulation, that they may be a witness for God. All right, so I hope this information is useful for you and that uh, perhaps you would share, I'll, I'll see you again, and perhaps you would share some of my videos. Thank you very much. I hope to see you again.